Hello everybody, this is Dylan Moore, um, and today we're just going to look at my most recent composition called Zephyr, One with the Wind. Um, this is basically just kind of like a behind the scenes look at the song. Uh, we're just going to go over some things that I thought about when writing it, um, and just some little things you might want to keep in mind if you're writing your own music, um, and hopefully you can use this video to learn or just to learn an interesting fact or two about the song. Um, so let's get started with that. I'll start out with looking at the score here, and we'll start with the introduction of the song. So this song actually started out as a piano piece. Um, I'll go ahead and play for you that original idea for the song, and you'll probably see how it evolved into what it is now. I think one of the biggest driving factors of the song are the woodwind runs that we see up here and the gradual chord changes that we see in the brass. Luckily, since brass and woodwinds are right next to each other in the score, this is really easy to demonstrate. You may have noticed that the piano piece originally had the runs in a lower register than the chord changes. So, sort of a fun fact about the song is that I originally gave these runs to the trumpets in the brass section and the chord changes to all the woodwinds. Um, this ended up sounding very strange and kind of mushy, um, and just not kind of what I was thinking in my head whenever I started writing it. So I just thought to myself, well, what if I flipped the woodwinds and brass? And I did that, and it worked great. It sounded fantastic. It sounded way better than I could even imagine. Um, and I think that's really attributed to the brass having this very mid-heavy, lush, big, chordy kind of sound to it when it's all played together that just makes the introduction of this song feel big even though it's only written at a mezzo forte dynamic. So right now we're looking at the Cubase project for Zephyr. Cubase is my preferred DAW especially for orchestrations because it has a lot of organization features in it uh, such as track folders and expression maps that even though this project file is a little bit crazy um, it lets me keep it a little bit less crazy than it could be. So I kind of want to go over one thing that we'll see here in the project file, and this kind of pertains to MIDI music making in general. Um, you can see that right here I have a track for harp, but if we open up this track, we'll see that there is no notes in the track. So why do I even have this track here? Well, you can see that in our modulation data, we have something here. This data is simply basically to zero out the modulation for the harp. I'm using VSL's Harp 1. It's a very beautiful sounding harp. Um, I think one of the best harp VSTs that you can get out there. Um, and Harp 1 gives you different sounds based on your modulation volume. If you have your modulation at zero, it will give you a regular harp sound. If you have it somewhere in between, say maybe like 70 or so, then you're going to get the harmonics. Harmonics are beautiful, but we don't really want those. A maxed out modulation is going to give you tremolo. Once again, beautiful, but we don't want it. So I make sure to end up with zero on my modulation value here. So that way, every time that I play the harp, I can make sure that it's going to be playing the sound that I want it to play and not accidentally change it somewhere along the line. Looking back at the score, we're going to take a look at the A section of the song now. Right after the intro, the song slows down and mellows out a lot, and one of the most prominent things about this section is the use of a DZ. A DZ is a Chinese woodwind instrument. When I play, uh, wrote this song, I really was getting some sort of oriental vibes from it. I just felt like it was very heavily kind of inspired by uh, that kind of music, and I wanted to kind of express that in the instrumentation somewhere. I decided to use some sort of woodwind instrument. 
Um, East West has a very good VST called Silk that has instruments from China, India, and the Persian Empire. Um, I specifically went for Chinese woodwind instruments, and I kind of went through them until I found one that I really liked. I eventually settled on using the DZ, and I think it sounds very good. Now section B. Section B is mainly just a repeat of section A, except just changing up the instrumentation of the melody a little bit. I wanted to add a little bit more motion to section B. While still kind of quiet and kind of mellow, I kind of wanted to give it a walking kind of feel, as if you'd started moving instead of just taking in the beauty of what's around you. So I added some pizzicato strings in here that are playing the on beats. It's a very simple instrumentation, um, but I think it adds a lot to the song. Just add some pizzicato. Just adding a little bit of instruments here and there can do a very good job of just adding more motion to your piece. Um, and it doesn't always necessarily mean that you're adding like loudness or anything, just because you're adding more instruments. Sometimes it's just adding a little bit of flavor. Now let's take a look at section C. This is one of my favorite parts of the song because we have the melody pronounced in the lower section of the orchestra, mainly in the cellos, bassoons, and French horns. First, let's take a look at the melody itself. It borrows a lot of the same rhythms from the original melody, but uses different notes over a different chord progression. This is a very good way to create a B melody to an A melody that you may have already written. Changing up the notes and changing up the chord progressions, but keeping a same or similar rhythm can add the much needed contrast in your two sections. So if we take a look at the melody written here, we're looking at the cellos playing the melody. Now since this is the main melody of this section, I want to bring it out a little bit more. So I decided to double this melody up with the French horns. Doubling melodies is a really good way to bring them out. If there's a section of your song that you really want brought out and it just doesn't seem to be sticking out as much, well try doubling that with another instrument. Different doublings produce all different types of sounds, so I encourage you to experiment with them um, and see what sound you like best. Personally, I have found that French horns, cellos, and bassoons, all of which I have used in this melody at some point, all sound very nice together. Another important thing is that you always want motion in your songs. Well, I say always, but it's a good idea to have motion in your songs. Sometimes you can get away with not having it if you kind of know what you're doing and you know what you want specifically, um, but I always try to keep songs moving. A very not good way of doing this is to have a constantly moving melody. As you can see, written in this melody, we have a lot of notes that are held out and not a lot of motion happening. But if we take a look at the score, we can see that in this space where a note is being held out in our main melody, the same space is being occupied by movement in another section. I like to call this a counter melody. Basically, trading a melody back and forth between instruments or instrument sections to create constant movement without breaking the flow of your melody. You always want your melody to breathe, but having another melody come in while your main melody is breathing can keep your piece moving forward. Sometimes it can create great results, as I think it did in this section, when the melody is transferred between the cellos and upper string sections. Another important thing we can note about writing for orchestra, or just writing in general from this section, is the use of more instruments to enrich your sound, especially on points that you want highlighted. I typically will add in more instruments through places like transitions, 
uh, peaks of melodies, ends of phrases, to give them more highlight and to add flavor to the sound. You have a plethora of instruments to choose from, so you always want to be adding instruments to enrich the sound, but not too much that it mushes the sound. For example, in between the transition of the first part of our B melody and the second part of our B melody, I add in some trumpet parts, as you can see right here. These horn parts just add some more depth to the chords being played, and I wanted this to sound a little bit bigger as the melody progressed. So that's why I added these horn parts at the transition between the first part of our melody and the second part. Another example of this is actually at the end of the melody. We see that a lot of woodwind sections, the higher woodwind section, comes in right at the end of the melody. I wanted the end of the melody to have a very large highlight. Not necessarily big, I know it's marked forte, um, but I just wanted it to stick out, to just kind of leave you with something, right? Right at the end of this melody. So I use these flutes to accent the downbeats. Well, not the downbeats, but the beats, the quarter note beats of the last measures. See them here. The flutes and clarinets are actually playing um, the same thing except octaves apart. Flutes and clarinets have a pretty similar um, like timbre to them, so using them as a means to work together is something I do frequently. Now let's take a look at section E. The section starts out with just a solo piano playing the melody. I'm going to use this section to kind of talk about EQ for a second. The piano is one of the few instruments in this uh, orchestration that I'm not using East West Hollywood Orchestra for. Hollywood Orchestra, all being built together, is mixed in a way that it will sound good kind of out of the box. Maybe it'll change up a little bit of things, but you don't need to do much as far as things like EQ goes to make Hollywood Orchestra sound good together. But to make other things sound good with Hollywood Orchestra, you might have to change some sound settings. So if I go ahead and open up my EQ Spectrum Piano, you can see that I have the high end raised just a little bit, just to give the piano a slightly brighter sound. This piano that I'm using, Ravenscroft 275, has a lot of low end on it. You can see that in this section, I haven't done anything with the low end. Because the piano is playing a solo here, I wanted the low end to really come through, so that way it didn't lose any bass as soon as the piano comes in by itself. If I go ahead and change to a section where we have some bass playing, such as right here at measure 48, you can see that my EQ spectrum has changed. Now I have a low cut on the EQ spectrum. So that way, the frequencies of the bass will take up that space and come out more instead of clashing with the piano for those same frequencies. EQ, especially when mixing other kinds of music, is something that is essential to think about. It can make or break your song. Having each section and instrument of your song take up one space in your EQ spectrum can make your song sound vastly better. So. Once you get to a certain point, say you're done with the instrumentation, think about EQ when you're at your mixing phase. Before I move on to section E, you may have noticed that in Cubase, a lot of tracks will have these lock symbols next to them. Cubase has a nifty little feature called track freezing. What track freezing allows me to do is make it to where a track will take up significantly less CPU power. Um, when you're working with very big projects such as this one, You'll find that that's kind of a necessity, as if you're using too much CPU, it'll overload, you'll get glitches, it's just kind of a pain to work with. So if you have a track that you're pretty much done with, you're not using, you can just freeze that track so that way it stops using all that CPU power, and then work on whatever track you need to work on. I have a lot of tracks frozen in here so that way I can record this session without having 
to use the CPU power of both my track, Muse score, my audio recording software, my video recording software, and my presentation annotation software all at the same time. Section E is all about tonality. Section E uses the exact same melody as Section C uses, but with trumpets and trombones really taking the lead in this one. I wanted this part to sound very grand, be kind of the climax of the song almost. So, I changed my melody from a beautiful French horn flowing cello to an aggressive trumpet and trombone melody. To go back onto EQ, to even further that in this section, on my trumpets, I have a huge boost in the highs to make them sound as bright as possible. I wanted these trumpets to really make you feel like you were walking into a king's castle or something, right? So adding a lot in the high end really brightens up these trumpets. This just goes to show on how you can take two exact same melodies and just arrange them in different ways to get completely different sounds. You just have to play around with it. So section F, the final section of the song, is once again a much more mellow sound. Very soft, but it has a more mystical sound to it. I did this by using a mark tree. Of course, that's not the only thing that's adding to the sound, but it is a significant contributor. Um, using a mark tree, especially in this fashion, to where it just keeps going and going, uh, really just kind of makes things sound like, I would describe it as like fairies almost. Um, along with this drone tone that you find in the violin section, it gives the song a much more mysterious kind of feel. As you can see, I ended the song with a crescendo into nothing. This was intentional, as I wanted to create a sort of where do we go from here vibe. Uh, as if it's not really quite answered, the beginning of an adventure. There's more to come. Um, I originally was having planning like a second movement to this. Um, that might still happen, but it won't technically be a part of this uh, piece anymore. It'll be its own thing if it comes out. Um, but that was the idea behind this ending. Um, I wasn't quite sure of it at first, but the more I thought of it, the more I was happy with it, and I thought, yeah, I think this is an appropriate place to end it. Taking a look back at the project file, there's some interesting little things that I have here and there that I think kind of add to the fullness of the song at this point. So in the sheets, I have violas and clarinets playing the melody together. Once again, it goes back to the doubling thing I was talking about earlier to kind of add fullness to your melodies. But in the Cubist project file, I have two viola sections, viola and viola solo. Well, sometimes you can add a solo sample on top of an ensemble sample to make it stick out even more. So just to show you that, here's the ensemble by itself. Here's a solo by itself. If I put these together, you can see that it has a little bit more of a brighter sound, but still sounds like an ensemble. It's a trick I use pretty frequently to bring out melodies especially in lower instruments such as viola, cello, or bass. Well, that's it for this first episode of this new series that I'm calling Behind the Score, I guess. <laughs> um, it's the first time I've done anything like this, uh, but I kind of wanted to just explain the song, uh, 
um, and maybe give like a little bit of tips and stuff that you could be watching and maybe learn something from it. Um, I'm all about <laughs> learning music. That's why I even make the scores to these songs, so that way it's easier to follow for musicians. Um, if I didn't care about learning, I wouldn't do the scores because they're a lot of work, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you learned something, or if you just want to say hi, uh, leave a comment below. Um, and if you liked it, well, smash that like button, bro. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know, do something to let me know that you liked it, so that way I'll continue to make these as I release more music. Um, but I had a lot of fun doing it, and I hope that you took away something from it as well. Um, so I'll see you next time.